You may be seated, and I am so thankful for Jesus. How many is thankful for Jesus today? All right, all across this room. Hey, I want you to take your Bibles this morning and turn with me to Romans chapter 12. And I understand that just last year we went through 62 messages uh, on the book of Romans. But I want to share this Romans 12 today as we uh, pick up from our series Back to the Basics, talking about the foundations of Warren Community Church. Today we are taking uh, the, the foundation of fellowship, and I'll be talking today about it, Pastor Ken, next week. And I don't know about you, but I love fellowship. How many love fellowship? Now, I'm not talking about, you know, eating a lot of fried chicken back here, or, you know, the old uh, potluck. I know that that's all great, and we do that. But I'm talking about fellowship, being with people who are like-minded, being with people who have the same heart, being with people who, who you get to spend your life with in, in a community. And what we uh, call our community uh, as a local church is Warren Community Church. But if we're all honest in here, life is short. Would you agree? It doesn't matter how old you are, how long you live, life is uh, short. And here's the truth. We will meet Jesus face to face one day. That, that is a 100% guarantee. And so I don't want us to, to waste time of going through what we call fellowship uh, kind of this this surface level thing where we gather together once a week and we come to come in here and we sing a little bit. You hear a message and you go home, and life's never really changing for you. W- what I desire in my life, and I hope you desire in yours, is that God gets a one hundred percent return investment on the grace that He has poured out and lavished upon our lives in the life that we live. I, I want to be around people that that I guess the term would be just explode with with fellowship, uh, the kind that makes you love more, makes you more compassionate, makes you, um, man, have more joy and be more holy and more zeal for God, the, the kind of fellowship that, that creates a boldness in our witness and the kind of fellowship that ultimately gives us the power that we need and, and vision that we need to become and do as God has called us to do. This is not just a meeting place. This is a place where God's people come together as the body, as a community, and we live life together. And this morning, this is what I want to talk about, just the fact that life is short, the days are evil, and the people outside this room, outside these walls are brokenhearted and hopeless, and they need to be able to look inside and go, man, what is it about those people that are so different? Why are they so happy when gas is of five dollars a gallon why are they so happy when eggs is going up out outrageous and there's no baby formula and all the crazy things that are going on in this world why are they still excited why are they so happy the world needs to be able to look into what we call warren community church and see that there is a difference in us so this morning i want to talk about just literally living life together and what that looks like. So Romans 12, first two verses kind of jump in. We know them by heart. It's talking about our spiritual worship. But right after verse 2, going into verse 3 and following, Paul begins to talk about how we should live this life together and how we are made uh, for one another. So I want to read a few of the verses. I'm not going to read all 21 at one time. We're going to kind of walk through them as we go. But let's read just a few verses and then we'll jump in. Uh, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. And do not be conformed to this world, but be you transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. For I say, through the grace given to me, to everyone who is among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think soberly, as God has dealt to each one a measure of faith. For as we have many members in one body, but all the members do not have the same function. 
So we being many are one body in Christ and individually members of one another. Having then the gifts, deferring according to the grace that is given to us, let us use them. If prophecy, let us prophesy in proportion to our faith. Or ministry, let us use it in our ministering. He who teaches in teaching, he who exhorts in exhortation, he who gives with liberality, he who leads with diligence, he who shows mercy with, cheer, with cheerfulness. Let love be without hypocrisy, abhor what is evil, cling to what is good. Be kindly affectionate to one another with brotherly love. In, uh, in honor, giving preference to one another, not lagging in diligence, fervent in spirit, serving the Lord. Rejoicing in hope, patient in tribulation, continuing steadfastly in prayer, distributing to the needs of the saints given to hospitality. Bless those who persecute you, and bless and do not curse. Rejoice with those who rejoice, and weep with those who weep. Be of the same mind toward one another. Do not set your mind on high things, but associate with the humble. Do not be wise in your own opinion. Repay no one evil for evil. Have regard for, for good things in the sight of all men. If it is possible, as much as depends on you, live peaceably with all men. We might as well just finish. <laughs> Beloved, do not avenge yourselves, but rather give place to wrath, for it is written, Vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. Therefore, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he is thirsty, give him a drink. For in doing so, you will heap coals of fire on his head. And do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. Let's pray. Father, we come to you, and God, I'm thankful for your word. Uh, God, I'm thankful that, Lord, this relationship with you is not just a vertical relationship, but it is a horizontal one as well. And God, just as we are in communion with you through your Son, Jesus Christ, God, we are in communion with one another because we have the same nature. Lord, those that are saved carry in them, God, the nature of Jesus. God, through the power of the Holy Spirit, you have brought a bunch of people, a lot of people together who would never uh, come together outside of being your children. So God, as we strive to live together, God, let us take what Romans 12 says and let us apply it to our lives, not only individually, but also as a body. And God, let us learn from what Paul is saying, these amazing people in Rome. God, we want to live uh, that way today. Father, we praise you, uh, Lord, for your word, for the Holy Spirit. And God, we thank you for what you're going to do, uh, Lord, in our midst today. In Jesus' name, amen. Uh, number one, I want us to think about this. Living life together is a necessity uh, for spiritual growth. Here's the thing. Spiritual fellowship is not a luxury. It is a necessity uh, and vital to your spiritual growth and health. All across this room, you, if you've been saved for any amount of time or even just a short amount of time, you know that there are people that God, sometimes He puts them in our lives, and you are a better believer, a better Christian, a better follower of Christ because that person has come along beside you and has helped you and walked along with you. We, uh, in our family and in kind of our circle of friends that we've been running with for many years now, we call it life on life. It's just simply living life together. It's not forcing anything. It's just coming together under the fact that we all love Jesus, we're believers, and we know what he has done for each one of us, and we try to live that life together, pushing and motivating each other along as we go. So this is not a luxury. It is a necessity. And J.I. Packer has some great insight on this. I just want to share this with you and kind of what he says about this idea of spiritual fellowship. He says, we should not think of our fellowship with other Christians as a spiritual luxury, an optional addition to the exercises of private devotion. We should recognize rather that such fellowship is a necessity. For God has made us in such a way that our fellowship with himself is fed by our fellowship with fellow Christians and requires to be so fed constantly for, it its, for its own deepening and enrichment. And I believe that fellowship done biblically in the right way is the most vital part of a Christian's life. So how do you define fellowship? Well, first, it's a life shared together. Uh, koinonia is the Greek word. 
you hear it a lot, and this can be defined this way. It's having something in common. It describes an interconnectedness that God has designed for us to have in community. It is the spirit of unity that comes from beliefs, convictions, and behaviors. All across this room, we should have some of the same convictions, the beliefs, and our behaviors should look alike. This deep fellowship produces a mutual co- uh, cooperation in God's worship. Uh, I love John, I love 1 John, and I love the way that John in 1 John just kind of jumps in. He didn't introduce himself. Paul would always introduce him. John just kind of dives into it. And in 1 John 1 and verse 3, he is is talking about this special kind of fellowship that they, talking about the disciples at that time, had with Jesus and how he wanted that fellowship to be with the people he was writing to. And this is what he says. That which we have seen and heard, we declare to you, that you also may have fellowship with us. And truly, our fellowship, koinonia, is with the Father and with His Son, Jesus Christ. He's going, hey, before we have community with you, before we have fellowship together, there's this man named Jesus that we have walked with. We have seen what He has done, we've heard what He's done, and we want to declare that to you. And I don't know about you today, but man, I just love to get with people who love Jesus. Like, that love the Word, that just like to get together and just sit down and talk about, hey, man, let me tell you what Jesus did for me last week. Or let me tell you what Jesus did for me in my life. Hey, man, God is doing such amazing things. I just love to be around people. I I figured this out just over the last couple weeks in church. I've been pastor now for almost 20 years. And I just learned this. Y'all ready? It's profound. Get your pens out highlighters, whatever. We spend more time in the church complaining than we do celebrating what Jesus has done. Think about in your circles. It's like everything that goes wrong, we talk about it. John didn't do that. John jumps in and says, man, I can't wait to tell y'all what Jesus has done. I watched him heal a blind man. I watched him walk on water. Man, he took this fish and these loaves of bread and he made some kind of awesome meal out of it. And you should just see all that he's done. Instead, we're like, man, you know, only ten people showed up. Man, why does a preacher preach so long? You know, worship team sometimes like, why the click track didn't work? And most of y'all out here don't even know what the click track is. We're worried about that and y'all... What about our fellowship being what Jesus is doing? When this fellowship is done with a deep love and authenticity for Jesus Christ, it displays this glory that the world longs for. This is the fellowship that Jesus died for us to have is this really close sharing life together. Coming together on what we do believe and agree on and not falling out on what we don't agree on. I've been in churches that fight over the carpet color. I could care less what cut. Well, okay, I do care. <laughs> but I'm not going to fight you over it. I was pastor in a church one time. Praise the Lord, before I got there, they had already decided what color the carpet was, so I didn't have to get in that argument because they had business meetings. We'll talk about that another day. But then we get into this idea, do we want the pews angled a little bit or do we want them straight? So we're in a business meeting one day, and I love it because people are voting. You know, you're supposed to give this cast this vote, and people are putting their paper over their face it's like everybody in the church can see you don't hold but 50 people so it's not like you're in a big auditorium and they're looking and they're looking behind them to see how this this family is going to vote so they can vote and and they're kind of doing that and i just stood up i said i'll be honest with y'all i don't care if we take the pews outside chop them up and burn them let's just have church right I, i mean let's just have fellowship together a deep, sharing life together. And so, it starts with a life shared together in Christ. 
If you're in here this morning and you're not saved, you can't force community as a lost person. It is something that God does in a, in a, in a very supernatural way. And so the, the other part is, is, it's not only a life shared together in Christ, but it's a life shared together with one another. In Acts 2, we see where it says that they devoted themselves. They devoted themselves to, to the, the, the apostles' teaching. They devoted themselves to, to fellowship, it says, breaking bread together. And, you know, it just kind of goes on. And, and I was even this morning coming over, I was talking to Tiffany. I was like, you know, that, that idea of devotion, that's not surface. They were all in with it. They devoted themselves to these things. And here's the thing that you have to kind of just kind of lay hold of this. And this life shared together with one another. If you're in here today and you're saved, here's and this may be hard for some of y'all, but we belong to one another. Right? <laughs> I hate to tell you. I know we're not in confession because we're Baptists and we don't, you know, do all that sometimes, but Here's what I want you to think about. You remember those cousins that used to come once or twice a year that you really didn't want to claim? I mean, let's be honest in the room. I mean, we... I, I don't even know. I, when my, my grandfather passed away, there was like a hundred cousins. I don't even know any, half of them. I know the ones I grew up with. But we all got to admit, man, there's those cousins that are like, are they really coming Man, can I stay home? I, y'all don't do that, though. Those cousins you don't claim, it's kind of the same way in the church. You may not want to claim me, but I'm your cousin. No matter of fact, I'm your brother. It's like, man, is Matthew, I don't know about that guy. Hey, I'm yours. <laughs> Welcome to the family. That's all I can tell you. But we are members of one another. We're members in unity. This is mysterious yet real. Uh, we are members in unity. This is not a suggestion that we try really hard to grow close together. This is a, a reality. It's something organic that God has done, and he's active in it. And it is a reality that if you're part of Christ's body, if you have trusted him for salvation, you are together sharing a life. Why? Because you have the same nature. But not only in unity do we share life together, but also in diversity. We do not all have the same function. I guess to put it in simple terms, we don't all look alike. 1 Corinthians 12 talks about how the Spirit gives gifts and how they, it's really up to the Spirit, the gifts you have. So if you don't like the gifts you have, if you just go argue that with the Holy Spirit and take the loss. But here's the thing, He gives it. And the reason there is unity in diversity is because of the Holy Spirit. But then unity and in diversity, there is mutuality. How does it all work? Paul says that we are all members of one another. When one rejoices, we all rejoice, right? So he uses the idea of a body, and it says, hey, no part of the body is as important as the other one. When one part of the body aches, the whole body aches, right? So when I was in the eighth grade, I was just kind of trying to think of an illustration. This is a poor one. It's the best I could come up with. When I was in the eighth grade, I was playing basketball, and I fell, and I broke my arm. And that night, my whole body stayed up to keep my arm company. <laughs> it was broke. Anyway, some of y'all get that later. <laughs> when we hurt, we should all hurt. Because we are one body in unity, in diversity, we all are one body in the Spirit. The church is not a place for lone rangers. We are together, and it is for a purpose. So then how do you obtain spiritual fellowship? I love what Psalms 27, 4 says. David says, One thing I have desired of the Lord all the days of my life is that's to behold the beauty of the Lord and to inquire in His temple. So in order to obtain this kind of fellowship, it requires a personal fellowship with God. If you don't have personal koinonia with God, you will never have it with another. This is where it starts, and he is the one who sustains it. Paul mentions two things here. He mentions, I beseech you, brothers, by what? The mercies of God. He uses that term. 
And then later on, he uses the term, the grace that is given to me. The two, these two things should motivate us. Because of your mercy, Lord, and because of your grace, I want to be in communion with you. I want to know you more. I want to love you more. I want to act like you more because of the mercy and the grace that you have poured out or extended to me in my life. And this I know. You will not worship who you don't love. If you do not have a deep love for Christ, you will not worship Him. And if you do not worship Christ vertically, you're not going to extend mercy horizontally. They go hand in hand. And you can't love one another the way that the Bible says without a deep love for Him first. But then it requires a mutual commitment to one another. 1 Corinthians 1.10 speaks of three things I think we all need to apply to our life. And this is what it says. Now, I plead with you. One, he's pleading. It must be pretty important if Paul is telling the church of Corinth, please listen and take hold. He says, I plead with you, brethren, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you all speak the same, that there be no divisions among you, and that you be perfectly joined together in the same mind and in the same judgment. So notice what he says. Three things. One, speak the same thing. Two, that there be no divisions or tears or schisms among you. And then three, saying that you be perfectly joined together in judgment and in mind. So what Paul is saying is there should be a common declaration in this room. When people run into folks from Warren Community Church in the community, we should be speaking the same language when it pertains to Warren Community Church and Jesus. You shouldn't have a different view to me. We all, if you remember, when you join this church, you go through class 101, and in 101, Pastor Ken talks about the structure of Warren. He talks about the doctrine of Warren. He talks about all these things. And at the end of that uh, class, as you get ready to come and, and, and actually join the church, you have to sign a covenant. And that covenant is saying that you agree to who Warren Community Church is. And it says some other things too. But it says that. It says, that, hey, we agree to what this church is all about. So when people meet us in the community and they ask you, like, where do you go to church or where do you worship, you should be able to say, man, I go to Warren Community Church. I love my church. God called me there. We love serving there. We love worshiping there. As far as the community goes, you should say it's the best church in Fayette County. And then if they run into somebody on this side of the church next week, they should be saying the same exact thing. Because we have to be joined together in the same thing in our declaration about who the church is and who Jesus is. Not only that, he's saying, listen, there should be no tears in the body. We should be so closely knit that if one thread is torn, everybody should feel the stress. So if there's a schism between members in the body, we should all feel it. And we should all act quickly to get it repaired. And we don't need somebody coming along, pulling a thread to unravel it quicker. We need somebody to come along and cut it off where it is and repair it. That's what he's saying. There should be no schism or division among you. And then he's saying, there should be a heart of unity that is grounded in doctrinal unity of what views we have with God, and the absolute ultimate goal is that of Jesus Christ. And our communion with God and our communion to one another should drive us for that unity. And so this is how we grow. Living life together is a necessity for spiritual growth. But then living life together is God's design for the church. Notice what he says in verse 5. He says, So we being many are one body in Christ. So look around the room. Many, we're one. 
Up under this umbrella were Warren Community Church. And he goes on to say, but all the members do not have the same function. So we being many are one body in Christ and individually members of one another. Now, there's 52 one another's in the Bible, or 52 another's, and y'all have gone through that as from what I understand a few years ago. And in this passage, there's 25 commands. I am not going to keep you that long, but we are going to look at 10 of them or something like that. I, I lost count after about four. Um, the first thing is we belong to one another. Verse 5 says it. He says, and individually you are members of one another. Now that sounds simple, but it's vital to remember who connects us. Christ is the one that connects us. We're not connected together by our ethnicity. We're not connected together by our socioeconomic status. We're not connected together by even our politics. What we are connected by is a man named Jesus Christ who bled and died and gave his life for us so that we could be saved and set free. And when he left here, he sent the Holy Spirit to come and indwell in us and walk with us so that we could be together. We belong to one another. I don't know about you guys, but I love big families. It's pretty obvious. I mean, and our family is like really growing. Like, it's like, whoa, slow down, y'all. But it is. It's growing. And what I love about our family is when someone new comes into it. You know, they come for the first time, and I'm going to tell you how we break people in. It's like if you you tell us that, I'll just use one of the girls, for example, because they're the ones at home now. They're like, hey, Dad, you know, I'm talking to this guy, and I want him to meet y'all. We're like, okay, we're going to schedule a barbecue or a cookout, and the whole family's coming. Like, everybody's coming. All the brothers, their wives, the grandbabies, grandma, grandpa, we kind of stop it there because we can't afford to feed everybody. Um, And we usually eat hamburgers or hot dogs because it's, like, really cheap. But I love it when they they come in and they, they show up, especially those who are not from big families. We want to overwhelm them. We want them to either go, man, I really like you, or this ain't cut out. We have run a few off intentionally. And on top of being a big family, we are a big family of Watkins. And if you don't know much about the Watkins, just, that's enough. You don't need to know any more. Just know we're a big family of Watkins. And, and I love it because sometimes I, I can watch their faces and they're like, man, I can't believe I'm getting myself into this. I, I remember one time specifically, a young guy came over, I won't call the daughter's name he came over and we like to play games and in our games we're competitive we're loud and i'm sorry if you don't like it that's just the way it is we had this young guy he was sitting on the couch he was on his phone and we were like hey you want to join us and 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 the the daughter of mine said you 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 want to join us and he like snapped at her i didn't have to say a word all four brothers got up And all four brothers looked at him and said, you do not belong in this family, and sent him out the door. But I love it. That's kind of like the church. When you get Christ, guess what? You get me. (laughs) Right? You get each other. I mean, look around the room. It's, it's It's a crazy bunch of unpredictable people sitting in this room. But through the Holy Spirit, through the power of the gospel, we all belong to one another. That's the beauty of community. That's the beauty of the church, is that this church is diverse. There's people from all over every part of the United States has gathered here. God has brought us together at Warren Community Church to live life together, to belong to one another. But then we build up one another. Notice what verse 6 says. Having then gifts deferring according to the grace that is given to us. So we build up one another. What are the gifts for? They're not for you to get celebrated and get a pat on your back. The gifts are for you to use those gifts to edify, to build up this particular body, if this is the body that you belong to. And what's beautiful about the Holy Spirit is it doesn't matter if you're from 8 to 78. If you've been saved and bought by the blood of Jesus, the Holy Spirit has given you a gift, and that gift is to be exercised in this body. 
That's the beauty of it, is Paul is saying in Romans and in 1 Corinthians that everybody in this room counts. You are important and special. Everyone has been gifted by the grace of Jesus Christ so that your gifts can build up one another. And just think, all across this room, if everybody that has been supernaturally gifted by God would engage in those gifts, what it would look like in this community. It would absolutely shock this community in a good way. But then we care for one another. Verse 10, notice what it says, Be kindly affectionate to one another with brotherly love. If you want to see what true Christianity looks like, I want to read this quote to you. This is from a 2nd century church author, Aristides, and this is what he says. I just want you to just listen. It's kind of a long quote, but just bear with me. Now the Christians, he's writing this to a king, 2nd century. Now the Christians, O king, by going about and seeking, have found the truth, for they know and trust in God who has no fellow. They refuse to worship strange gods, and they go all their way with humility and cheerfulness. Falsehood is not found among them. They love one another. The widow's needs are not ignored. They rescue the orphan from the person who does him violence. He who has gives to him who has not ungrudgingly and without boasting. When the Christians find a stranger, they bring him to their homes and rejoice over him as a true brother. They do not call brothers those who are bound by blood ties alone, but those who are brethren after the Spirit and in God. When one of their poor passes away from the world, each provides for his burial according to his ability. If they hear any of their number who are in prison or oppressed for the name of the Messiah, they all provide for his needs, and if it is possible to redeem him, they set him free. If they find poverty in their midst and they do not have spare food, they fast two or three days in order that the need might be supplied with the necessities. They observe the commandments of their Messiah, living honestly and soberly as the Lord their God ordered them. Every morning and every hour, they praise and thank God for His goodness to them. And for their food and drink, they offer thanksgiving. Such, O King, is the commandment given to the Christians, and such is their conduct. I would say that in this place, that this would be our conduct. That's not just coming to worship on Sunday mornings. That is truly living life in a real, authentic community that God has designed for Himself. We honor one another. Notice what it says in the latter part of 10. In honor giving preference to one another. This is thinking corporately, not competitively. This is not trying to one-up the next person in the body. This is not trying to gain ground of the next person in the body. This is not saying something to someone else to make another person in the body look less than. It's defined as gossip. Ephesians 4 talks about it, and it is a killer in the church. Do you know that it is sinful to speak about a brother or sister to their face and behind their back if it's not edifying them? He says, don't have nothing to do with that. Stay away from it. Ephesians 4 says that it grieves the spirit. It says that it quenches the movement in the church. And I'll tell you, I I don't want to stand before God one day and God say, man, I was moving at Warren. But because of your double tongue, I stopped it. And that's what happens whenever we choose to do those kind of things. And instead of doing it, we must guard against it. And instead of tearing down, we should look for opportunities to build up. And even if you get away with it here, heaven sees it. And God will not put His stamp of approval on your life if you partake in this. So on the flip side of that, we honor one another. 
with humility. And we build one another up in edification. And we celebrate what God has done in every one of our lives. But then we motivate one another. Notice what verse 12 says. Rejoicing in hope. Let, let's motivate. Hebrews 10, 24 says, Let us consider one another in order to stir up love and good works. Have you ever been around somebody that when you walk away from your conversation or time with them, you say, I'm a better person or better Christian because I've been around that person? Right? Anybody? I, I have. And I walk away sometimes from people, and I'm like, God, thank you for just 10 minutes of their time. Thank you for just putting them in my life so that I can learn from them and be more like Christ. And that's the kind of relationships. And may this be the commentary of all of our relationships that we, that we spur one another on. The, the, the word there in, in Hebrews 10, 24, where it says, let us consider one another to stir up, literally means to spur or to agitate. I know we got some horse people in here. And I'll say this about horses. I rode them enough to know that when you put spurs on, it ain't about telling them how amazing they are. It's about motivating them to move. Right? There's nothing comfortable about spurring a horse. And sometimes we need to be agitated in the church to look more like Christ. Sometimes somebody needs to strap on some holy spurs and give you a good kick so you'll be motivated to move for God and not stay seated in the comfortable chairs. He says, let us consider one another. If I love you as much as I say I love you, part of that love should be to stir you up, to motivate you to live more like Jesus. And what a glorious picture that is in the community. Then we share with one another. Verse 13 says, distributing to the needs of the saints. And the word distribute is pretty amazing because it, in its and its root word comes from the word koinonia. So you really can't have true fellowship unless you are sharing with one another. And being a, in a Christian community involves uh, contributing to one another in some kind of way. Uh, we're able to experience this together. And just think of the possibilities. And this is not just for the core people. This is for everybody. So I would just invite you that if you're standing on the fringes of this community, come on into the circle. Come on into what God is doing and what He desires to do and let God use you and share the gifts, share the talent, share the abilities, and share the resources that God has given you in order to move forward the vision that God has given Warren Community Church. We rejoice with one another. 15, rejoice with those who rejoice. We don't envy other successes. I mean, we should be excited when people succeed. We rejoice with them. We're not competing with them. We're coming along beside them and celebrating the good things that are going on in their lives. But then he says, weep with those who weep. As I was going through this, I just kind of wrote these questions down. It's rhetorical, so just hear me out. Who do you know in the church who will rejoice with you in your highs but will also weep with you in your lows. Now everybody, I just, I said that, everybody had a name. I hope a name came to mind. If a name didn't come to mind, you need to find that name. But then on the flip side of that, who in the church would come to you whenever they're weeping? That they go, man, I know that if I call him or her, they're going to cry with me. They're going to come sit beside me. And can I tell you something real, just, just kind of a side note? When somebody calls you and they're weeping, they don't always need an answer. They just need you to sit beside them and cry. They don't always need you to go, yeah, I know what you're going through. Probably you don't. Just sit down with them and be willing to weep. One of the most... I do not want this to sound morbid at all. But one of the ways that this was played out in our lives several years ago, and I wouldn't wish this on anyone, but God done something pretty fantastic in this moment. When I was pastoring 
Grace Point in Whiteville, we had a, a family in our church, and the young man had been killed uh, in a dump truck accident that day. And I got the phone call that not only he had been in the wreck, but he had died. And his, his mom was on her way to the hospital, and the man that called me went to our church. He worked for the ambulance service in, in Bolivar, and he calls me, and he says, Hey, Matthew, I just want to tell you up front, that not only has he died, but it was a pretty horrible accident, pretty bad head injury. He says, I want to prepare you for it as you go in. And Tiffany and I walk into the, the room where this young man was laying. And that mom came into the room. And I don't know about y'all, I, I will say this, the head injury wasn't disgusting or anything, but because of the head injury, he was just bleeding. And for three and a half hours, we sit in the emergency room with that mom as she walked around that bed and cleaned the blood off of her son. You know what I didn't tell her? I know what you're going through. But you know what I did do? I just constantly handed her a towel. Here, take this one. And I don't say that to say we're special because I'm going to be honest with you. This is one of the hardest days of my life as a minister. But what I would ask you is if somebody called you, would you just sit beside them and weep with them? That's what it means to be in community. That's what it means to be in community. And listen, and we've experienced it while we were here. Just over the last few months, as Tiffany lost both of her parents in a month, there have been those of you in this church who have come and sit at our feet, literally. And we don't take that lightly. That we're that kind of community and that kind of bond because of who Jesus is in our lives and in your lives. So do you know someone or are you that person? We bear one another. This one's fun. Verse 18 says, If it is possible... As much as depends on you, live peaceably with all men. Hey, listen. I don't say all this to say I understand we're all sinful men and women. Right? We all get our feelings hurt. All of our flesh rises up from time to time. We're not perfect. When we get to heaven, our community will be perfect. But until then, man, it's, it's broken. And sometimes we say things we shouldn't say. At other times we do things we shouldn't do. And the Bible says that in those times, we should bear one another. Now, I'll tell you, this is easier said than done, right? Pastor Ken and I sometimes uh, sit in the office and just kind of talk through some things and laugh, and it's like, I remember looking at him one day just several months ago, and I'm like, man, I don't know about you, Brother Kim, but I could feel, I could feel the flesh, like it was rising. And I had to back off, because not with him, okay? I don't want y'all to think my flesh was getting riled up with him. Something that happened, I'm like, man, there's a part of you that just wants to just, like, react. But you have to just back off and have humility. And sometimes you just have to bear one another. Right? And I will tell you, thank you for bearing me at times. Because I know that well, my wife will tell you I'm not easy to bear sometimes. But we bear one another. That's part of community. And here it is. These are commands. They're not suggestions. If you belong to the local church, if you belong to the church as a whole, these are things that God has told us to do. The church is for the church. We're not against one another. And if we're not careful, we take for granted on a weekly basis the people that are sitting in this room that we call our family. But it's not only for our spiritual growth. It's not only that, that we, we have fellowship together. It is for a bigger purpose. And that purpose is the last thing. Living life together is the greatest evidence of the gospel. How else does the world know that we are saved? Because we have a sign out there that says, Warren Community Church? How does a church know that we are a family? The Bible says, Jesus very plainly says it, by the way you love one another. If we want the world to see the gospel 
not just hear it, it's the way we love one another. And that's the evidence. Living life together is the greatest evidence of the gospel. Why? Because we reflect God's glory. Notice what he says in 12.1. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by what? The mercies of God. And then he says later on in verse 3, For I say this through the grace that is given to me. So you have mercy extended and grace given. We exalt the mercy of God in worship, right? But we extend the mercy of God in our relationships. Think about the cross. Vertically, we worship horizontally we extend and it's to one another our vertical relationship with god has a direct effect on our horizontal relationship with the people around us because paul says by the grace given to me and then he immediately starts talking about the church and the way we should relate to one another so so make this connection all across the church we've gathered together to what exalt god in worship but to extend mercy in our community they go together and you can't disconnect the two. Let's be really honest in here. If you have a broken relationship with a believer in this room, your worship didn't go any higher than the ceilings. And the best you can hope for is, thank God, these ceilings are fairly high. Because in some churches, they wouldn't get eight feet. That's how important it is that we extend mercy to one another and grace to one another, because if we don't, it hinders our worship to Him. You can't disconnect the two. Uh, we can't gather together for worship and then have nothing to do with the people in our community. This is why Christians cannot be content just sitting in a worship service then walking away without a real meaningful connection with one another. But not just that, we reveal God's message. We live in unity and we long for authentic community. In a very practical way, the gladness of the family reflects the glory of the Father. So, so in, a, in a home, if you just, just bear with me for a second, but in a home, when a family is glad in a relationship and everything is clicking along, everything is going great, the family loves one another, they're excited, it reflects on the Father. Because the Father is the head. The Father is the one who is responsible for everything else that goes on in that family. Now, you can't control some people, but I'm just saying as a whole, when things are going great, man, boy, that's awesome. Dad, good job. But when things are going bad, and the family's disconnected, it also reflects on the Father. It's like, Dad, what are you doing to bring your family together? What are you doing to, to bring reconciliation in the family? So if that's the case, think about how much bigger that picture is when the body of Christ, the church, has a division. It reflects on the Father. And when the world outside looks into this room and this room is broken in division, the world says, if that's the kind of Father He is, I don't need to be in that family. We live in unity. And unity is not just for the sake that we don't get emails and phone calls. The unity is for the sake of the gospel being lived out for the world to see it. And you sure do sleep better when you're in unity with the fellow brother or sister. And if you just come in and participate in the service and then walk out, and you just kind of walk out and say, I don't want to deal with those hard-to-love people. You are those hard-to-love people. We all are at times. But we want to be in unity. So what people do is it's a lot easier to live in isolation. It's a lot easier just kind of get to yourself. It's a lot easier just to walk away and not have to bear one another's burdens or serve together or work together with those around you. But that's not a picture of the gospel. That is not a picture of Christ. The glory of God is displayed. The gospel is displayed when people are committed to one another in a community. So don't miss that because you've been invited in by the Holy Spirit to be part of this community, as we know as one community church. So we don't just reflect God's glory. We don't just reveal God's message, but we respond to God's mission. 
We have love for one another, and we have love for the world. The Bible says that love covers a multitude of sin, right? So what that really means is that your sin should never extend past my love for you. If you've hurt me, if you've said something about me, and I'm just saying me, I, nobody's done that, I'm just saying that, I should have such a love for you that it covers it. If I've said something that hurts you, or I've done something that hurts you, based on the love that lives inside of you as a believer, you should be able to look at me and go, you know what, I don't like what you did, but my love for you is greater than the sin against me. That's having love for one another. This other stuff is just a bunch of fluff. If you can't love me in the worst moments, then you don't love me in the others. And that's the way it should be. So we shouldn't want to put a question mark. You heard this your whole life. Don't put a question mark where God put a period. We have to love one another. So what that means is we live our life in accordance to this book. It doesn't matter how smart man gets. It don't matter how many years we are from, from, from uh, first century Christianity. Here's the reality. This book is still relevant. This book still tells us how to live our lives together with one another. And it has no mistakes in it. It tells the truth, and this is what we should live by. And so when we think about responding to God's mission, loving one another, loving the world, here's another rhetorical question. What would you be willing to do to see someone you know saved? You can get all kind of answers to that. Well, I mean, I'd be willing to die. Ah, maybe. I'll give up everything I have just to see my brother saved. Maybe. But here's something I want you to think about. And this is not a question of missions or evangelism. This is not a question about going overseas or feeding the hungry. It's simply this. Are we willing to just simply love one another and live out the Bible so that God's glory is revealed and His message is revealed? I mean, here's the best way I think for me to say it. Is there should be such a love in this building for one another that it screams redemption to the world? Look at those people, man. Look at them. I don't know how they love each other the way they do, but man, they're just they're like just crazy in love with one another. They're crazy in love with Jesus. That's responding to God's mission. And here's just the truth in closing. We need one another. In this room, we need one another. I can tell you this, I need you. My family needs you. Your family needs the other person sitting beside. We need one another. This is the picture, this is the design that God has given to us. Is that we live life together. And I want you to think about this as we wrap this up. There are no meaningless moments in the body. Every exchange with others. I want to tell you how important this day is. Every exchange with others count for eternity. Remember what I said at the beginning of the message? There's a 100% chance that you're going to see Jesus face to face. 100%. You will stand before God. So every conversation, every relationship, everything that we do counts for eternity. And here's, here's just the, the bottom line. We are either weakening people's affections for God or we're strengthening people's affection for God. In this community, in this koinonia of Warren Community Church, in these relationships that you have all across this room, the way we treat one another, 
the way we respond to one another, the way we love one another, the way we motivate one another, you're doing one or two things. You're either weakening somebody's affection for God or you're either strengthening somebody's affection for God. Everything we do counts for eternity. That doesn't mean we have it all together because I don't. I'm a mess most of the time. But what I do know is I want my relationships to count for eternity in a way that people are longing to see Jesus. That's why we're a church. That's why we have a foundation called fellowship. Is it is a necessity for us to grow as believers. So in closing, I'm going to ask this question. What kind of neighbor are you? What kind of brother or sister are you? Are you weakening people or are you strengthening people? Father, we come to you today and God all across this room. Lord, we have the joy. God, the beautiful, amazing joy of being in fellowship with other believers. God, you could have saved us and put us on an island somewhere. Could have told us we got to live by ourselves and just figure it out. But God, you gave us one another to help us to walk through this life together. Rejoice together, weep together, share together, care together, bear together. It's all about being together. So God, my earnest prayer this morning in this room is first, if there's any division amongst anybody in this room, or maybe not in this room, that God, during this time of response, that people will go and make it right. Father, we want to lift up your name. We want to reflect your glory. God, I pray that there be such a, just a, a common life together that, God, the enemy is not allowed to penetrate it. God, I pray that in this room, if there are people in here today who's like, man, I want to be part of that kind of family but I don't even have a relationship with Jesus, that God, today be the day of salvation. And God, today be the time that they, Lord, come to know you. Father, I pray that today, among all days, God, that you just do a supernatural work, God, in the body of Warren Community Church. God, we love you today. God, we praise you today. God, we celebrate what you are doing. And God, I just personally want to thank you for giving me the to Lord, just the privilege of being part of this body. And God, we thank you today and we praise you today in Jesus' name. Amen. As Pastor Ken comes, we'll be standing down. And today, if you need to come, if you need to go to somebody, whatever it is the Lord speaks in your heart to do, I ask you today just to be obedient to Him. And just watch what He does. <laughs>